I love the word cook. Because the word cook in Spanish is cocinero. A cocinero is a person on the stove, filling the fire. For me, it was very clear that I wanted to create an organization that we will be able to respond to events that disturbs the lives of people. I am Jose Andres. We are here with a simple mission, to make sure that food is an agent of change. There's no food, no water. Puerto Rico was a game changer in every aspect. He took a backpack, and I don't even know how they got there. What we found when we landed was catastrophic. In a crisis, you call on the experts. No one was calling on the cooks and chefs of the world when there were people who were hungry. He was doing so much, and yet feeling like it wasn't sufficient. I'm almost getting a million dollar line of credit of money I don't even have. I worry a lot when he goes, because you never know what crazy thing he would do. She's asking when we're coming back home. Soon. We gotta feed some people, and then your dad can come back. He's got big dreams and this vision, but it's always rooted in what's possible. This is the spirit that was in our kitchen, the pot that will fill the world. Bueno, no hemos perdido clientes todavía. The emergency has this amazing way to speak to you. You only have to listen. You can listen to the situation. You can listen to the wind. You can listen to the people. Please welcome to the stage, Jose Andres, chef and humanitarian at Think Food Group, and Ellen McGirt. you. <laughs> People, a great place you. to work. Look who is here. Look who is here with us. You happy with the chair? Well, I, want, I want them to see me. Well, now I have to. I want, can you see him too? Uh, and I, and I w <laughs> want them to see you. Oh. <laughs> I was joking with everybody backstage that as I really racked my brain to think about this, that um, that Jose Andres is one of the few people in the whole world that we can all agree on, right? That we are happy to see him coming, that we believe in his mission and we love him. I know there's probably some people who disagree. You're not allowed to say a word about them in this moment. We just want to enjoy being with you. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes my daughters, when I'm cooking at home, Okay, that's fine. They tell me, Daddy, can you let Mommy cook? We like her food better. I'm like, <laughs> so you, I'm coming from an interview that they say you are one of the best chefs in the world, and then your daughters don't want you to cook. <laughs> Believe me, it's, it's, it's hard. <laughs> that we can relate to, but on the global stage, we can all agree. But I, I, who's eaten at a Jose restaurant? Who, like, Oh my God, they have so many more guests. We have to do more, yeah. But I, th I think I'm old enough to have eaten at the Quilted Giraffe back when you were just starting out. I'd like to believe that I was part of the journey from the beginning. Oh my God, the, the Quilted Giraffe, I don't think a lot of people even, I, I don't say that often, but that was the top restaurant mm. in New York. In New York, yeah. In the late 80s. Yes. At the Sony Building. Yes, yes. Uh, Barry Wine was the, was the chef. Uh, visionary because the restaurant was Asian, he had love for, yeah. was Japanese. Yeah. And, and I said, I spent there, I think, three, four weeks only. I, I, I left my, the restaurant I was working in New York because I was not very happy with what was going on in the restaurant. It's a tough business. And I went there I and my life changed forever because that restaurant was very special, very unique, very precise. And that month in that restaurant, Le Gulti Yuraf, it really, opened me um, my world that if you dream about anything was possible. Yeah. The Gulti Giraffe actually is a restaurant I never mentioned, but actually had a huge personal influence in me as a person and as a cook. 
Well, I'm glad I mentioned it. My, I, my face literally hurts from smiling at him. This is, <laughs> I'm so delighted to be talking with you. I want to read something from Vegetables Unleashed, which is one of my favorite books of yours. It's just amazing, although I'm not going to make the compost potatoes. I just, we can tell us about that in a minute. This is from your friend and, and co-writer, Matt Goulding. Jose is a contradiction in a chef's jacket. He's a big man who fights for the little guy, a suburban dad with the soul of a poet, a man who holds conversations with homeless guys on one block and politicians on the next, and a passionate practitioner of plant-based cooking whose image can be found on a 300-foot-long mural on the Vegas Strip holding a jamon. And I thought that was a wonderful way to describe all of the multitudes that exist inside of you. Yeah. Uh, Matt Golding, the, the writer, is one of my best friends. I think he's one of the best food writers anywhere in the world. And for me, the, the reason to do the book was not just to have a book, to, to sell some books. Uh, the reason to do a book is to tell stories, right? And yeah. to share with others what you feel. But also for me, it was spending time with Matt, because I really love him. Uh, and when you do a book, it's almost like uh, you're taking a trip, like you are traveling within you, outside you, you're getting to know things that you thought you knew. You know, I'm 53, mm. people make me an expert on Spanish cooking, but the more, the more things I know about the Spanish cooking, the more I know, I know nothing. Mm. So it's kind of fascinating. Uh, this vegetable book was a way for me to say, you know, I'm a big boy, I love meat, uh, I do. Uh, but I love vegetables even more. And this is what we eat at home. So this book for me was to say, uh, in this moment that we seem we all have to be black or white, right or left, high or short. It's like, why we can all be a little bit of everything at once? Because you may be short, but you jump on top of a high mountain and you are the tallest person in the world. Why can't not all be like a rainbow? Mm -hmm. And what you describe from the book, that yes, is a vegetable book, but then as I'm talking to him about vegetables and my love for vegetables, I'm slicing a pork leg. <laughs> this is what I do believe life should be. It'll be people don't eat meat. It'll be people because for different reasons don't eat pork. It'll be people that love the vegetables, but you see, Longer tables wins the day, not higher walls, and where you are respecting others in the same way others are going to be giving respect back to you. And food very often is this amazing way to achieve this. It's the other thing we can agree on besides you. Sitting together over a plate of food, a delicious plate of food that's beautifully created, beautifully made, beautifully grown, beautifully harvested. It's a good way to live. Yeah, I think, I think we forget that um, you know, I don't quote French people often. In, <laughs> I'm from Spain, I'm a cook. France, Spain, you know. Uh, yeah. I mean, no. it's the way it is. Uh, but was this guy called Briat Savaran in 1826 uh, wrote a book called The Physiology of Taste. Mm. Was uh, like a philosopher. Uh, a gastronomer, and he's the guy that said, uh, tell me what you eat, and I will tell you who you are. And this is very powerful, because I do believe all of us, I can speak for myself, but probably some of you agree with me, that we are always in the search of who we are. We are always on the search of where do we belong. And sometimes we are looking far away when the answers are right, maybe in the sofa we are, next to the people we have. But we are all seem to be searching somewhere else. But food, in a way, it gave me this sense of knowing who I am. And if you really think about it, probably if you start getting deep after I speak talking, food can explain who you are. Even when you lie, when you are a big liar after Thanksgiving by your grandma, that you explain to your friends at work that you had the best turkey in the history of your, of your life and you know the turkey was dry like hell. <laughs> but it's okay because the experience of that moment was bigger than if the turkey was well done or not. Mm. So food is powerful. 
a plate of food is more than just the calories or the yeah. dish or the recipe. Yeah. Food itself, I always believe, tells the story of who we are as a person, who we are as a family, who we are yeah. uh, as a nation, yeah. uh, who we are as planet Earth. So food for me, yes, tell me what you eat and I may be able to tell you who you are. Yeah. Well, and when you are in desperate need, when you have lost everything and when you have little hope or dignity and you're afraid, a plate of food means so much. And your commitment to this tells us a lot about who you are. And I, I do want to dig into that work a bit. I know that when you're leaving here today, you are heading down to Fort Myers Beach. Can you give us um, an update on the work down there before we get into the origins of it? Well, uh, uh, Wolf Central Kitchen teams, um, um, we, we always try to arrive before in hurricane, so for many years we're doing, I think, already close to over 600,000 meals. We are doing 50, 60, 70,000 meals a day. We have 45, 50 food trucks that we partner with. We could have our own food trucks, but I always this, uh, thought that was better than, who better than the locals to help the locals? So I can bring 100 food trucks from, So uh, I can bring 100 food trucks, uh, and one day, and we have those trucks, but if I can open local business, that they have empathy, mm -hmm. local food trucks, and I can put them in a strategic places, if I can go to Sanibel Island or Pine Island through helicopter because the communities, they've been totally disconnected by the mainland because of bridges, Showing up is just a way to send a message, you're not alone, we're with you. So, um, so I'm gonna go and spend one more day. I spent myself five, six days uh, in a helicopter going to Sanibel and, and Pine Island and for Myers Beach until everything began being normal. And right, we right. need to understand that normal yeah. means it's a lot of destruction. Um, but anyway, uh, Wall Central Kitchen is this organization we created with this very simple idea that wherever there is an emergency, we will show up as quick as fast. The urgency of now is yesterday. Yeah. And we will show love and respect to people to tell them you are not gonna walk alone mm -hmm. until things get better. And food and water is not gonna be a problem. Uh, in, in Ukraine, we reach 175 million meals with 550 restaurants, uh, 40 warehouses. <laughs> uh, in Bahamas, we reached 3 million meals, 80,000 meals a day across 14 islands. Ukraine was hard for me, and probably the last weeks have been, the last month have been a little bit in a strange territory, maybe opening myself too much to you, but we got two people killed that I never met. Mm. But in a way, I am just one more guy in Wall Central Kitchen. I'm the founder, but just, I'm a board member. I'm, yes, I've been, I founded Wall Central Kitchen, so I'm the guy that has been the longest in this organization, and I have experience that I've gained. On, but I never imagined in my life I will be losing people in an emergency yeah. like that, and that makes you start thinking about life in ways you never thought you would think. Mm -hmm. At the end, we are only as good as the people we have around us, especially with men that uh, I think women are far away more generous uh, I think was a hidden woman you know, when they brought the beginning of what America began with the people. I think it was a woman who put with the people there. Because if a man brought that, will be I the person. <laughs> um, uh, and, and I mean that uh, sincerely because at the end, we are only as good as the people we have. Yeah. Myself, I've been very lucky always to be surrounded by people that make me better, and I try used to make them better back. Yeah. But I'm, I'm always, I, I always realize that I am the sum of all the people that bested yeah. love, energy, and time in making me better. Yeah. And then I realize that it's the responsibility of every one of us to try to do a little bit of that back to everybody. Yeah. At scale, I mean, this, you, the numbers that you shared are just enormous. Can we, let's go back to the origin, when this was an idea, a possibility that you saw, that would have been in Haiti after the earthquake in 2010, and you also, um, your friend who run a remarkable organization called the DC Central Kitchen. Yep. 
So my mom and my dad were nurses. We had a nanny home, and the hospital was the place that my mom and my dad will exchange my brothers and I. So I spent a lot of time in the emergency room because I was waiting for my father or my mother to finish their shift and to take us home or to take us to the, to, to the school. Um, I always saw the, uh, the nurses, the doctors going the extra mile. Nothing right. was a surprise for me when this pandemic we saw yeah. all the doctors and nurses putting themselves even in danger, going beyond duty to try to bring comfort one life at a time, one hospital at a time. For me, it was no surprise. Uh, I did the, 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 my life happened through cooking and, and my father always loved to cook and my mother always loved to cook. My father is who really showed me the, the power of controlling the fire. I tell always this story that my father didn't let me do the paella, the big rice pot that my father cooked every other weekend for friends and one day I wanted to do the cooking. He always put me doing the fire, and I got very, very upset with him one day when he didn't let me do the cooking when I wanted to learn to cook, not to do the fire. He sent me away. And then my father, after everybody ate, told me, my son, everybody wants to do the cooking, but the most important is controlling the fire. Learn your fire, master your fire, and then you can do any cooking you want with your life. This was not only a lesson for a young cook in the making, but this was a matter for life itself. All these stories are important because for me, when I do the Spanish Navy, I am, first time I come to America, I was a sailor. I learned the power of 300 people working in a boat, moving that boat against the currents and against the winds to the safe port we were looking with the people working together. But then I arrived Washington, D.C. I meet Robert Egger, the founder of DC Central Kitchen. I'm 24, a soup kitchen not only feeding hungry people, but more important than that. Everybody was talking about food waste. The organization will get the food waste. But what they were doing is making sure we were not wasting the lives of the people by giving homeless ex-convicts an opportunity to learn a profession. In the process, getting that extra food produced to feed the homeless. In the process, they will graduate, and restaurants like me, we will hire them. One dollar not only thrown at the problem, meaning feeding the hungry, but one dollar multiplied by four yeah. invested into the solutions. Right. Robert Erger told me that philanthropy, charity, seems is always about the redemption of the giver. Mm. When philanthropy must be about the liberation of the receiver. Yes. yes. With all these lessons, my mom was a nurse across my first restaurant in Washington, D.C., a red brick building, who they discovered the house and the offices of a woman, a woman uh, that was legendary. And there they discovered where she lived and all her papers. Is a woman that was part of the flying hospitals during the civil wars, beyond, behind the front lines, taking care of the wounded. Is a woman that created the missing soldier's office when things happened to soldiers, was trying to find out what happened to them so the families could have closing. It's a woman that created the Red Cross. That was Clara Barton. I began connecting almost with my mom and my dad, and a nurse like her was able to do, not only take care of the few, but think about how she could take of the many. Mm -hmm. This began planting the seed in me in more ways than not, of I am a cook, I feed the few. But can I also learn, like maybe Clara Barton, to feed the many? Every one of you in this room, you have that talent to do what you do for the few you may touch through your job. But also maybe that same talent, in a very simple, creative way, can be used to be touching the lives of the many. Katrina was huge for me. I watched from the comfort of my home what was going on in the low nine. All these thousands of people in an arena with no food and water. And I thought, man, why? But they didn't do anything. When Haiti hit, I was in Cayman Islands. That day I said, I'm not gonna watch from the comfort of my home anymore. I'm gonna go to learn. Mm. That's when I went, 2010, after the earthquake. And we began 
what I call is my lifetime learning in how not only trying to fit the few, but trying to fit the many. Going back to Katrina, last September was another hurricane. We were right there. I uh, was able to come actually from Haiti because it was another earthquake. And I came from the earthquake in Haiti last year, yeah. almost 10, 11 years later, back to New Orleans, back to back. The, the place that gave me the first opportunity to serve in an emergency and the place that began making me think about how to help in an emergency. Do you know how far away is the warehouses that bring food to the city of New Orleans from the Superdome? Mm -mm. 0 0.7, 0 0.8 miles. Any one of you with me, we could walk, even under rain, even with water by the belly, open some of those warehouses because there was people there, grab food, bring it to the Superdome, and start feeding people like that. It doesn't require an MBA. You don't need to be Einstein. You know what an arena is, I learned? Everybody has it wrong. Everybody thinks that an arena and a stadium is a place that you go to watch NBA games, or NFL games, or hockey games, or musicians. No. An arena, a stadium, is a gigantic restaurant that entertains with the sports and musicians. <laughs> so that's how we began, making big problems into simple solutions, yeah. not planning, but adapting. We are all taught to plan and to create plans for the different situations in life. And the walls are full of plans. What happens, my friends? That when something goes wrong, is not a plan for that thing. Why? Because nothing goes wrong in the way you plan to go wrong. <laughs> because that's why it's wrong, because it's going to try to have you. If you train everybody to follow a plan, but that plan never is not in the wall anymore, yeah. everybody freezes. Yep. When you embrace the mayhem and you see it as an opportunity to serve in your lives, in your business, in your nonprofit, in your church or synagogue, yeah. every opportunity when things don't go as planned, it's an opportunity for you to serve. It's an opportunity for you to become creative. It is an opportunity for you to adapt. Adaptation will always win the day over planification. Plan less, adapt more. And all of a sudden, life is, becomes much easier. You know, I, before I met you and before I heard that, I had this romantic notion about how you would lead an organization as big and as specific as this. You know, everyone's trained in food service to keep food clean, to, you know, keep everything hygienic. I mean, you really have tremendous training built into what you already do to see a restaurant in places like boats and arenas. So it's, you bring a, a rigor and excellence to this work, which is why you joke, you haven't lost any customers yet, which is a wonderful way to look at it. But my, my romantic notion, you had a burst of a creative insight based on looking at the world around you. You saw a possibility and you would stand up and say, Chefs for America, let's feed every furloughed you know, line worker in, in restaurants now that the pandemic is shut down. And then I thought to myself in my Fortune magazine voice, oh, that's ridiculous. That's not how organizations work. And then I saw how you operated backstage in the green room, and I think that's exactly what happens. <laughs> I think you stand up and you have a burst of insight, and you have by some combination of rigor and mission and calling created an organization around you that can respond to that kind of institutional brilliance in the moment. My fast, my fast is your slow. I think that you've created an organization of people who can adapt. How did you do that? Well, I mean, you know, obviously I have different, different movies in my life. I have different lives in my life, but they are all interconnected. I mean, I feel like I keep jumping from one movie to the other. Yeah. You know, when I go to an emergency, to a hurricane, my wife always has the luggage, even without me asking her. 
and she almost says, vacation time. I'm like, really? When I go to an emergency, when she calls vacation, it's like, man. Anyway, yeah, I understand her. I mean, we've been 30 years together. I'm very much everything I do is thanks that I always had her making me uh, in, 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 in more ways um, successful uh, than not. But I think part of the lessons I learned through life was that Especially when we speak about organizations, right? Do, do you have a napkin? Anybody has a napkin? Do you have a napkin? Ah, you don't have a napkin. That's fine. I have a pillow. Um, so, you know, um, organizations, we always tend to build them pyramidal, right? And so somebody sits at the top of the organization, right? And, and you are the boss. And everybody's right. lower, right? And so you are here at the top, right? Yeah, and you may, you're a good guy, or a good, a good person, a good woman, a, whoever is leading. And then you think blue. And what happens with ideas in organizations, even in families, any organization, any structure in tribes that is gravity, right? Everybody understands gravity, Newton, the apple that hits you in the head, oh shit, gravity, gravity. <laughs> Organizations are like an apple falling from the tree. Somebody's above, has an idea, blue, shh, comes down quick. What happens? The boss is thinking. Who, uh, Jose is thinking. Oh shit, what is he thinking? Blue. <laughs> Next day, the menus are blue, the curtains are blue, the tables are blue, the specials are blue. <laughs> they, they, everything is blue. And then I go to the restaurant, I'm like, what's happening? Well, you said blue. I'm like, shit, I was thinking, I was dreaming. I, I, I may be the boss, but I can dream. Doesn't mean it's an order. Yeah. So that means that sometimes these structures don't help. That's right. That's but right. then you have good ideas on the people in the bottom, the new people, the younger people, or newer people. And they come with great ideas. But what happens with gravity? The same gravity that brings the bad ideas down quick. Don't let the good ideas go up. Because gravity is keeping them down. And often than not, you will have some people in the pyramid without, when nobody's watching, like, calm down. <laughs> I'm, I've, I arrived here first. It's like the Mount Everest. You know that now it's more people in Mount Everest than is in New York City? Everybody's trying to climb. Same thing, calm down. And then what happens that you have good people working maybe on the same idea on different sides of the mountain, mm -hmm. but they don't see each other. So they cannot work together. We need to start changing more and more the structures of families, of government, mm -hmm. of businesses, of relationships. And we need to start making them flatter. All of a sudden, I am not the boss by being on the top of the pyramid. But you are the boss because you have the boots on the ground. You are not the boss because the title behind your door, but because you are leading with example being right there. All of a sudden, the flat organization allows everybody to have an opportunity to bring their idea. Doesn't mean that that idea is going to be done. You know, it's like you have a bike company and somebody says, no more biking. Now we need to walk. You're going to be a shoe company. Well, maybe that's a stretch. But you understand what I mean. <laughs> Ideas that make sense. All of a sudden, everybody sees each other. Yep. Everybody participates. Everybody is vested in the success. Mm -hmm. Everybody believes that they own that place they belong to. Yep. So I don't know if this is answering what you asked it me. It did, it didn't it? It but, did. But it did. this is why I believe. Less pyramids, much more, less mountains, and much more flatter. I do believe is the way to go. And that's why the local partnerships mean so much having people right there. So we don't have much more time left. We could talk to you all day. Um, <laughs> let's just say in an alternate world, you were just a regular wonderful person, but you weren't famous. Maybe you were a farmer or um, a wonderful person with ideas in their organization or just an aspiring writer like I always will be. And something terrible happened to you and your life was temporarily washed away, whatever that was. What meal? could we make for you that would signal that we understood you and that we loved you and would give you the comfort that you needed in that moment? What would that meal, what is that meal for you? 
Oh my God. Oof. You cooking for me? Um, we're, we are all cooking for you. Uh, well, I just came from a fasting, 30 days fasting, only 300 calories a day. Yeah. I lost 75 pounds with this pandemic. Wow. So, if something happens, I go on fasting and you will not have to feed me. <laughs> but we want to restore your I'm spirit. sure there's great cooks in the audience, but just in case. When I go to the house of a friend, I always tell them, I'm on a diet and I'm fasting tonight. <laughs> then I see the food and then I say, well, today I'm going to have a bite. <laughs> it works. But it's many dishes, right? Um, if money was not an issue, I will fly to the most faraway place and tell you to get me sea urchin from Spain or from Hokkaido. Okay. Because I love sea urchin. Okay. I mean, I think I was a seal in another life, the animal. <laughs> because I love sea urchin people. I mean, sea urchin is my thing. So in an emergency situation where your house has been washed away, we bringing you a plate of sea urchin from Mallorca? No. <laughs> I know, but, but my point is, is this, this is not my last meal, right? No. All right. <laughs> so, my mom always cooked for me this white rice boil, a slightly sauteed with some garlic okay. and a Spanish olive oil, tomato sauce homemade, and two fried eggs. Two fried eggs? Two fried eggs. We can do that. We call it arroz a la cubana. In Cuba, they don't have a clue what this is. <laughs> I went to Cuba, and, and I was like, very disappointed, like, nobody knows this dish in Cuba. But if you tell me something that like, will bring me comfort in yeah. my lowest moment, in my most difficult moment, uh, a plate of food that will bring me hope and will connect me with the person I was on my early yeah. young years, yeah. that will be that dish okay. that will bring it together. Arroz a la cubana a la de madre de Jose. Arroz a la madre de Jose. Okay. Yep. Okay. So I asked that question because here's what I want us to do. It's probably not going to happen, but there's a pretty good likelihood that you're going to continue to get real acclaim for this work that you do with your team all around the world. Let's just say, for example, that you win a Nobel Peace Prize. Just saying. We're just... We're just saying it hypothetically. Mm. Or something that really matters, that puts, shines a light on the work. Here's what I want us to do. I want us to cook that dish for each other, for people we love, for people in our communities that may need that dish, you know, wherever it is, it's a community center, it's a library, you know, wh wherever it is that, for people around you who could enjoy it. And we're gonna have a live viewing party, great place to work style while well, you give your acceptance speech and we're going to take over the socials with this dish from your mother to thank you and this moment of all the things that you've done for us. We're going to need a hashtag for that, right? But that's what we're going to do. Take the comfort in from your story and to thank you so much for all the work that you do and will continue to do in the way that you comment on the world, on food security, on sustainability, on leftovers, and of course, unleashing vegetables everywhere you go. Jose, thank you so much for being here. Thank you very here. much.